It's 11.45, Friday night. We're at Daikoku Futu PA, and my crew and I are rolling towards the C1 Highway Loop in Tokyo. Hunters, roll out. Autobot, roll out. Our goal tonight is to practice coordinating and choreographing shots using our own cars. For years, I have been working on a documentary about underground car culture, but in the last several months, I have managed to pull together a small team who believes in my vision. I'm chasing my passion for cars, filmmaking, and telling stories, and my big goal is to one day produce a Hollywood movie about this underground world. It's a big dream, and it's been a long road to get this far. I'm gonna be ahead of the pack. There's only two lanes, camera cars. In this episode, I'll talk about how I came to Japan, became a street racer, and eventually started this documentary series. We look back at the ups and downs of my journey and talk about the importance of chasing your dreams. To do that, Let's go back to where the series first started. I'm Albo, and this is my origin story. This is a chronicle of my personal experience exploring the underground car scenes of Japan. Follow my journey and discover the rich culture and history of street racing, drifting, and everything in between here in the land of the rising sun. This is The Hunters. Wow, what a beautiful view. Hey guys, so today we are at Mount Miyogi here in Guma Prefecture and I thought today this would be the perfect setting to take a look back at the journey to 100,000 subscribers and take a peek at the road ahead to a million. At the end of this video, I'll tell you the three most important things that I've learned on my YouTube journey thus far and I really hope that this video inspires you to work really hard and make something that you believe in. You know, it's hard to believe, but I started this channel over 10 years ago, before I came to Japan, before I started Drift Hunter, before being a YouTuber was even a thing. I just made videos for my friends and my family. YouTube was just a place where I posted my tricking samplers, which are videos of me doing flips, and my cheesy martial arts short films with my friends. Then, when I moved to Japan in 2010, I decided I wanted to document my journey living abroad. I started a blog about my experiences on the JET program and my channel became another facet of this experiment where I would share videos of daily life and random adventures in Japan. Being a JET was an incredible experience and I hope that my videos would inspire some people to apply to the program in the future as well. <laughs> Living in Japan, I knew there would never again be a better chance to enjoy driving on the amazing local mountain roads and so, I bought the cheapest sports car I could find, a Mazda Miata for $2,000. So being young and dumb, I actually fancied myself a little bit of a street racer. Although I didn't really know what I was doing, sometimes when I would go for drives, I would come upon another racer on the toge, and naturally we would get into a bit of a battle. I don't endorse what I did, and I was, I, was, I was young and dumb, and I really didn't understand all of the conduct and all these unspoken rules of, of running the toge. And so while I was uh, a street racer in a sense, I wouldn't call myself a hashiria, and that's an important distinction that we're gonna cover later. However, through the love of cars, I made some very good friends. And one of those senpai introduced me to the drifting scene in Gunma. You're a real drive sports car. Get your car, go sideways, you have no fucking excuse. I will go way more in depth into this whole story in an upcoming video series. But for now, let's take a look back at the start of my journey to make a movie. This was my first documentary video about the underground drifting scene in Japan. My senpai took me out onto the toge where the street drifters gathered. And after I witnessed some runs, I realized it was the most mind-blowing thing I had ever seen in real life. I somehow got permission to shoot and edit a video, and after posting it on YouTube, it was picked up by Kotaku. When hundreds of people started asking me to make more videos, I realized that I had to dive deeper into the scene because I was one of the only foreigners who had this level of access into this underground world. I realized my mission was to document my experiences for posterity. I knew I had to make something never before seen, and so I followed it up with this video, which officially introduced my project to the world. And then this video, which is all about Gunma, the area in Japan where Initial D is set. This video explained how the anime was and is based on reality, and set the stage for the rest of my series. That video took a really long time to put together, and so I resolved to try daily vlogging for a while. It was really fun, but it stretched my bandwidth and I found that I didn't have as much time to work on the documentary caliber videos. But I kept refining my craft and devoting half the time to the vlogs and half the time to the documentaries. Through the daily vlogs, I met a lot of cool friends and did some other random videos with other famous YouTubers. 
I also started to double down on making really elaborate videos. My theory was, I'll just make the best video of its kind on YouTube and people will watch. But the reality is, YouTube is really, really, really hard. It's incredibly difficult to stand out. I got depressed by the performance of the daily vlogs and I decided to start putting more effort into the documentaries. This video was an amazing collaboration. A writer from High Snobiety contacted me and I think it was one of the videos that really put me on the map. Next, I followed it up with the release of this video which is still one of my favorites. It was basically three videos in one. I really started to get comfortable with being in front of the camera. However, as time passed, I also got more and more discouraged because of how long it was taking to grow on YouTube. Still, I diligently worked hard. I had this belief that if you just keep going, if you just don't quit, if you show up every day and just keep putting in the work, things will happen, that I would get lucky. So here's the thing about luck. I think it's basically the intersection of random chance and your own efforts. But another way, it's where opportunity meets preparation. So while you can't control opportunity, you can at least control being prepared so that when opportunity passes you by, you're ready to strike. Well, one day, the most unbelievable opportunity passed me by. This was an event that was so absurd, it still boggles my mind to think about it. It's so ridiculous that when I look back, I still feel like it was somehow like, like destiny or something. I know it sounds crazy, but if you've been following my channel for a while, you probably already know what this event is. If you've never heard about it, prepare to have your mind completely, completely blown. We're gonna jump right into it after this break. If you've been following for a while, you might recall my meeting with a man named Jun Fujinoki. But for those of you who are new to my channel, let me recount this astonishing story. So I was sitting in McDonald's just now. I was uh, having dinner and I was writing some stuff on a computer. And somebody literally walks up to me and, and just shows me his, his phone and he's watching Drift Hunter. He parked beside my car and he saw my Drift Hunter stickers on the car. All right, so for you guys to know Initial D, well, okay, so his last name, this guy I just met, his last name is Fujinoki. All right guys, so here's why this was the most mind-blowing thing that has ever happened to me. Here I was making a documentary series comparing the anime to real life when I met Fujinoki-san who turned out to be the real-life version of Takumi Fujiwara. His grandfather owned the shop that the shop in the anime is based off and he himself used to do deliveries of tofu up and down Mount Harna and street race on the weekends. It's such an incredible, incredible occurrence that it's, it blows my mind. We both realized what a ridiculous situation this was and although we had only met 15 minutes prior, Fujinoki-san immediately invited me to his home where he and his family graciously showed me memorabilia from his past. This was such an astonishingly serendipitous meeting that I'm still at a loss for how to explain it aside from fate. It was that moment that convinced me I was heading in the right direction and that I had to continue. Reinvigorated, I kept going. I doubled down on everything. I went out filming more and put out more documentary videos and blogs. For the past two years, this has been my primary focus. Towards the end of last year, my visa and contract at my job at the time was coming to an end. I decided to get serious. I decided that this was it. I had to find a way to take all this to the next level. I knew this wasn't likely to happen from the countryside of Gunma. I needed to find a way to move to Tokyo. After this quick break, we look at stage two of my journey, moving to Tokyo, so keep watching. Searching for a job in Tokyo was very, very difficult. I had managed to pull together some interviews, but nothing seemed to click. That is, until one day, a very dear friend of mine called me up. Thomas. Thomas is one of my closest friends. We came to Japan together on Jet, went on countless adventures around Japan together, and built a community website together called The Jet Coaster. Our work together on that project helped him land a job at a prestigious executive consultancy firm and things finally came full circle when his connections landed me an interview at an American tech company in Tokyo. Remember what I said about how luck is basically opportunity meets preparation? Well, at the interview, I basically just talked about my experiences working on that website and how working on the channel had prepared me in many different ways for the role that I was interviewing for. Long story short, I got the job and I was on my way to Tokyo. Since I moved to Tokyo, a lot of crazy stuff has happened. 
I've intended to put it all into daily vlogs, but because of how crazy my job is, I haven't had the time to basically edit everything. So here's a quick recap of all the stuff that has happened. By the way, I've posted about all these things on my Instagram, so if you're interested in following my journey, make sure to follow me on Instagram as well. After I started my new job, I moved into a house in Ikebukuro, a grungy area of Tokyo being rented by my YouTuber friend Pikyo Sam. During this time, I literally lived in a tiny room under the stairs. Okay, it's hard to appreciate the sense of scale, but okay. So I'm about 175 centimeters, and when I stand up straight, my head hits the ceiling. Living in that tiny apartment in Ikebukuro was both a really humbling experience, but it was actually also really exciting and a lot of fun. But you know what? Here's my philosophy on like these little struggles. Like, this is the kind of thing that eventually becomes part of your origin story where you had to deal with like crazy situations. Actually, I felt like I was Harry Potter living underneath that little room under the stairs, chasing my dreams and working really hard for what I wanted. After the break, we'll visit America, check out my upcoming book, and look for a bigger place. All America every day. I went to California on a business trip where I met some of my amazing fans. I tried to organize a small last minute meetup and was shocked by how many people came out to meet me. It was really incredible. That night, those new friends introduced me to the night driving scene in the canyons of LA. It was an amazing contrast to the toge of Japan. While in California, I also reached out to another car YouTuber, Randy Trong from Eliminate, and we became fast friends. I hung out with him and his crew for several days and came away from the whole experience feeling completely reinvigorated and excited to keep growing together. When I came to Tokyo, it was just one serendipitous meeting after another. For example, I randomly met one of the founding members of the Midnight Club, which is the most notorious and legendary street racing teams that ever ran the streets of Tokyo. That meeting kind of made me realize that there was so much more to document than just the drifting scene here in Gurren Prefecture. There was a whole world of car culture in Japan. What's really, really interesting is that a lot of this seemed like just random chance and like weird opportunities. But the more that I've been working on this project, I have this feeling that if you figure out exactly what you want to do, and you work really, really, really hard at it for a long period of time, there's something beyond just random chance that happens. It almost feels like like fate. And I know that's not the most scientific way of thinking about it, but I really personally feel like if you are willing to work hard to put yourself in the path of it, amazing things will happen if you're willing to chase your dreams. And so my weeks were spent hard at work, and my weekends were spent either filming in Gunma or filming in Tokyo, breaking into the underground street racing scene of the C1 Loop. Around this time, I started getting serious about writing a book. I met the author of my favorite book about Japan, and he was kind enough to introduce me to his publisher. I want to introduce you to Hector. Hector wrote this amazing book called The Geek in Japan. I was looking for a publisher for uh, Drift Hunter Origins, and I was like, okay, I have literally no idea where to start. I don't know how to get into contact with him. You contacted me through Instagram. It was a very intelligent strategy. In, in this meeting, I was hoping to ask him a little bit about, uh, you know, what it takes to produce a book. Of course, I was hoping to maybe get an introduction to, to his publisher. If you want to become a writer, just write something real that is happening to you in your life or your experience. And there is not many people willing to put the time. You send me uh, some pages, and I could instantly fill your years of life inside here. You already have all the best things for a, book, for a good book. I'm sure someone will publish your book at some point. Wow. Let, let's see what happens. I cannot promise anything, but let's, let's make it real. <laughs> Contract size. <laughs> kind of distinctive red mark. For the past year, I've been chipping away at my book, fleshing it out as this story evolves. Then this past spring, I had to move out from my Ikebukuro place due to a number of unforeseen circumstances, one of which was my roommate Sam becoming super famous and deciding that he would be moving to California. And so I packed up, started searching for a new apartment, and finally found a place that I wanted to move to in Kanagawa Prefecture, a beautiful area 35 minutes from downtown Tokyo. So this is basically it. This new couch. Uh, this is the kitchen. After the break, we'll dive deep into the culture, and I'll tell you what I learned from the Hashiriya. With my life now falling into place, 
I could really focus on one ambassador, making documentaries about car culture. Every day after work, I would find an empty meeting room and edit videos late into the night, sometimes spending so long in a section that I would miss the last train and have to crash in a capsule. Then, it turned out that one of the students I was working with at my previous job used to be a street racer, and so I went back to Gunma to interview her, and I put out a documentary episode showing how deep the history of the culture is. Like, not in Miami. That is crazy. While in Gunma, I would also spend more time hanging out with Mr. Fujinoki, and we became very good friends. <laughs> of course, I lost. After years of working hard in relative obscurity, it seemed like something new was happening every week. Moreover, through making these documentary videos, I learned so much about Japanese culture, especially how the Japanese hashiriya treat their passion. It's crazy how much the guys love what they do and they're willing to spend you know their hard-earned cash, their hard-earned money on such an expendable item as like these hires which go so fast. Crazy Japanese! Crazy Japanese! However, while Hashiriya is the closest equivalent word to street racers, in my opinion, they are kind of different. My image of street racers is typically of recklessness, selfishness, and immaturity. Most Hashiriya, on the other hand, in my experience, often have a sense of social responsibility. A very Japanese pursuit of perfection. And a deep adherence to a code of conduct, which has been established over many years and generations. はい。で、全員で下ってくんです。バーって。ああ、一緒。はい、一緒。で、全員が下ってったら最後の人のプロダクションとかストマとかに上がってくる。で、途中で例えば I felt that somehow, I had to convey this to my viewers to show you guys what this world is truly about. Then, the pivotal moment of 2018 happened when I released my latest documentary, Roulette Zoku. The loop racers of this is the hunters. As of now, this video has passed over a million views and driven 60,000 subscribers to my channel. All right, so we are here now at Hunters. The success of that video has reaffirmed my self-belief that you have to keep grinding and never give up because all it takes is one home run to change everything. When we come back, we'll look at the future of this channel and where it's all going. guys about another amazing meeting that I had uh, this past year. I randomly met the outgoing head of the YouTube space in Tokyo throughout the course of my daily work life and after telling him about my project he introduced me to his former boss who is now the head of the Discovery Channel in Japan. I had a meeting with the Discovery Channel and I'm excited to see where this whole thing goes. How is this gonna take YouTube to the next level? So here's the thing about being a YouTuber. It gives you an enormous amount of creative freedom and you're able to make exactly what you want. But to really take it to the next level, I think 
it's hard to do it alone. You need a team. For the past half a year or so, I've been working really hard to put together a core team of people that I trust and I believe in. I've got a team of the hunters. For the past few months, we've been exploring all these underground themes. We've been diving deep into the world of the C1 Highway Racing. Moving forward, I'm really excited for the next stage of this journey. You guys can follow this journey in different mediums now. You can follow my Instagram and I also have a podcast called The Hunter's Podcast where I talk about this journey and basically car culture in this whole project. It feels like little by little, I'm making progress towards all of these goals that I had, which seemed really, really hard at the beginning. But if you keep working hard, you make a lot of progress towards them. Hopefully I'll be able to produce a documentary series with a big team. And this is just one more step towards the big goal of a Hollywood movie. Okay, we're almost at the top of uh, this peak of Mount Miyogi. Just kind of randomly decided it'd be a good idea to climb. It's kind of a metaphor for the point I'm trying to make. Like I was saying at the beginning of the video, there's basically three things that I hope you come away with from watching this. The first is be ambitious, have a big dream and keep chasing it because you never know what's gonna happen if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. That leads me to my second point, don't give up. Most people will quit less than halfway. So you just have to keep going, keep pushing, keep persevering and just never give up. Because if you have a dream and you think it's worth it, you owe it to not just yourself, you owe it to the world to get that dream to come to fruition. And third and final thing is enjoy the journey. Because, oh, as you can see with this beautiful sunset, it's not about the ending, it's about the journey. About all the challenges and the tribulations and the pitfalls and the times when you think you're gonna give up, when you think you're gonna fail, and you just keep going, that's what makes it worth it. Don't focus too much on the end and just enjoy the journey for what it is. Because it doesn't really matter if you're able to accomplish exactly what you set out to do at the beginning. Going on that journey will change you in ways that you can't even imagine right now. By the time you get to the very end, it's a spectacular view, but just as important is the whole journey along the way and all the memories you've made and all the friends that you've met along the way. All right guys, it's getting dark, so we gotta head back. I know you guys have been waiting for a long time for another video that is coming up and it's the Kanjo Zoku documentary video. I've been working really hard on it, so here is a quick preview for you guys who've been waiting for a long time. In the fall of 2018, I met a member of the infamous street racing gang, No Good Racing, at Daikokufuto PA in Tokyo. After interviewing him and telling him about my documentary series, he introduced me to his fellow gang members in Osaka Prefecture in Western Japan. After months of planning, Ken and I traveled to Osaka to meet No Good Racing, Warp, Temple, and their various associates who comprise the infamous Osaka Kanjozoku, or Loop family. After exploring the underground Tokyo scene of Gunma and the high stakes world of highway racing on the Tokyo Loop, I thought I had seen it all. These three days showed me how wrong I was. This is a glimpse into the world of my friends, the Osaka Loop family. This is the Kanjozoku, and we are the Hunters. Hey guys, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that quick preview. If you guys enjoyed this documentary, there's a bunch of ways that you can support it if, uh, if you'd like to see even more. I've got a merch store where you can pick up the Hunters and Drift Hunter goods uh, right down here. I also have a Patreon if you want to support the Patreon as well. I want to take a quick moment to thank my patrons for supporting uh, this channel. Guys, your support on Patreon really helps keep this channel going and helps me to grow it even more. If you guys don't know what Patreon is, here's a quick clip. Patreon exists because when creators are paid, they can create more amazing things. Things that inspire us, teach us, challenge us. Creators of every kind, podcasters, YouTubers, musicians, writers, allow their fans to become patrons. Patrons set a monthly subscription style payment for the level of membership they want. This provides creators with a sustainable income while retaining full creative control. And it allows fans to connect with them on a whole new level. Thousands of creators and creative teams are using Patreon to run their business their way. They're doing what they love and they're being paid to do it 
by the people who love their work most. My goal in 2019 is to be able to work on Drift Hunter full time. And if only 1% of you guys supported me on Patreon, I know I know I can make it happen. And you'll get access to behind the scenes previews, extra stuff like wallpapers and podcasts and special interviews, stuff that doesn't make it onto the main channel. So I'd love for you guys to check out my Patreon. The link is in the description box down below. All right guys, so for today's Japanese word, I'm gonna teach you not actually a word, but an entire phrase. It's korekara mo yoroshiku onegaishimasu, which means uh, moving forward from now on, thank you for your continued support. And that's how I feel. And I just want to thank you guys so much for supporting this journey from zero to 100,000 subscribers. It's, it's pretty incredible and I feel super blessed. And keep watching. I'm going to jump right into my next documentary video, which is the Real Life Soka video. If you guys enjoyed this video, drop some comments below. Uh, leave some bananas and let me know what your favorite part was. So thanks again so much and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Since I moved to Tokyo, I've been exploring the underground car scene here more and more. While in Gunma, People race and drift 90 sports cars on the mountain roads. In Tokyo, the lack of toge and the high cost of living gave rise to a different type of street racing subculture. Racing on the Wangan Sen and Shitoko, the inner city highways of Tokyo. 